Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the live stream. I hope you're all very well this evening. Let's see who's on the stream tonight. We have Derek. Great to see you, Derek. We have also Enzo the God. Great to have you on, Enzo. Raven1983, Witch. Great to see you. Roseanne. Great to have you on. Killer. Great to have you on moderating once again. We have uh, Katrina. Great to see you, Katrina. Kathy Doyle. Great to have you on. Trisha. Great to see you. John O'Sullivan. Great to have you on, too. We also have, uh, let me see, Chatty Rat. Great to see you, Chatty. Tiny Demolition Lover, hope you're well up there in Scotland. We also have uh, Susan, great to see you. And um, Corinthian Moore, great to have you on. Marty, um, sorry, Maria, the debate, great to see you. Paul, great to see you. Uh, hope you're well. We have ah, Jan Williams, thank you so much for that super chat. Very kind of you. Cool. Uh, we have, let me, th and thanks and hello to, to Jan as well. We have CJ, I'm great to see you CJ, Ho hope you're well. Pete Gra Pete Robbins, great to see you. Um, Kushti Makush, <laughs> great to see you. Uh, this is always some funny names, come on. Uh, CG, great to see you. Jean T, great to have you on, hope you're well. Reagan Elite, great to see you, hope you're well. Um, Dr Draconic, great to have you on, hope you're well today. today. We have uh, Ministerian, great to have you on, hope you're fine. Lee, great to see you. Uh, we're up to 138 already, so I'll have to go pretty quickly as always. Um, i just go FSM, great to see you. Wayne, great to have you on. We also have Jasper, great to see you. Nodi Alsi, great to have you on, hope you're well tonight. Tom, great to see you. Tom Nelson. Ruth, uh, Kendra, great to see you. Richard Prosser, great to have you on. And so many more. I can't say hello to every Mandy. Mandy Brown, great to have you on. Hope you're well tonight. Thanks for all of your comments. Kind ones. <laughs> also to, to Ron. So I, I see Ron is doing quite well today. He sneaked on board uh, the, the channel and posted a video about the visa, the cost for the visa. So, of, of course, I, I don't know where he gets, gets his information from, but uh, he he has some strong opinions on things. Um, somebody had asked me if, uh, if I could debate Ron. Maybe I could try and work that out. He's a bit uh, difficult to get hold of from time to time. So I can try him. I, I can try my best. <laughs> uh, Raven, great. Night Raven, great to see you. Inconsequential, great to have you on too. And... We Scott's dog, hope you're well. We also have Verthi, great to see you, Mitch. And so many more. Uh, so Ron has been spending a fortune on flags. <laughs> yes. Although the British government, I think, are spending a bit more than uh, Sir Ron is spending on £176,000 or something like that on, on flags. Because, you know... There's a crisis <laughs> and, you know, there isn't money for free school meals. There isn't money for uh, dealing with the homeless, you know, the homeless crisis. There isn't um, there isn't money for nurses or doctors, uh, but there is money for flags. It's always the same case. The, the government will spend money on what the government wants to spend money on. Does Ron live in Max's basement? Well, I don't actually have a basement. I have a garage, so and the garage is full of junk. Um, so he might be hiding, or he might be hiding out there, uh, hiding behind some boxes. I don't know. <laughs> um, budgie butt. Okay, so let, let's jump to this first story. It just popped up on my news feed before I came on the stream. It says, government draws up contingency plan for fire break COVID lockdowns over winter. This is concerning. So Downing Street confirms that it's preparing for local, regional and national lockdowns to ensure that there is no danger of the NHS being overwhelmed. Um, it says, while number 10 is confident that the vaccine rollout will prevent COVID hospitalizations rising to the level that led to previous lockdowns, there is serious concern that the NHS could be put under pres intense pressure from issues such as large uh, resurgence in patients suffering uh, serious flu symptoms a senior government source told i the newspaper 
that the Prime Minister authorised planning for a fire break lock, for fire break lockdowns if a number of factors combined to push the NHS to breaking point in the autumn and winter months. There's um, there there are also said to be concerns at the sharp uh, at a sharp increase in the number of NHS staff taking sick leave following 18 months of fighting on the front line of the pandemic. The government believes that it has got to grips uh, with the pandemic following the vaccine rollout. The government advisor said the government advisor, barring a new vaccine beating strain, fears over the rise in of the rise in infections similar to those seen last uh, last autumn are actually outweighing the other issues like the NHS staffing crisis and the likely resurgence of flu infections and other respiratory diseases. On top of COVID infections, these factors could tip the NHS back over, back to the brink and force more lockdowns. However, the source added the government is determined to avoid the long lockdowns the UK has endured since the pandemic struck in 2020. I think it's important to be prepared. Um, it's unusual that the government are saying this, that they're prepared, they're ready to do another lockdown if necessary. Um, it could be an attempt just to appear ready, but not actually plan to do it, even if things get really bad. Um, we've seen it before, Boris Johnson. Yeah, yeah, we're prepared for any any inevitability, and then it turns out that they're not prepared. Um, and at the other, in the other way, Boris Johnson has said we're not going to go into a lockdown, or we're not going to go into, we're not going to do any circuit breakers, and then he did. So I, I'm not sure what to read from this. Um, you need to see a doctor, Sir Ron. This may be a bit of a shock, but you have an alter ego calling yourself Max. Um, junk in garage. Max is your code for. Younger versus Kvaraj. <laughs> That's very well put. That's a very well put together uh, pun. <laughs> Maybe it is. <laughs> that'd be that mean Junker versus garage. <laughs> Farage, sorry. Um, <laughs> junk in the garage. Yes. Oh come on! Did anyone believe the prime minister saying irre irreversible? <laughs> No. Um, Nico, great to see you on the stream. Hope you're well. Get, get your bog, get your bog rolling now. <laughs> yeah, there may be more. Uh, see, it could also be an attempt to mitigate or hide, I should say, hide some of the damage of Brexit. Say, Look, we had to go into another lockdown um, to protect the public from Brexit. <laughs> Because which does Boris John which does Boris Johnson fear most? People will rebel over the lockdowns, or people will rebel over Brexit. Probably he's more concerned about Brexit. That's why government ministers are always talking about how uh, it's nothing to do with Brexit. It's you know the shortages have nothing to do with Brexit. It's all to do with the the pandemic. And has the pandemic run its course, or is it still being used as an excuse? <laughs> like, uh, how long is the pandemic going to last? Surely it's over by now. Um, how long do people have to self-isolate? I think it's 10 days. And how long has the pandemic been used as an excuse f to defend to against the damage of Brexit? To deflect from Brexit, I should say. I think it's been over 10 days. Uh, just woke up. Did he call another lockdown? Uh, no, he's not calling for another lockdown, but he's saying that perhaps if necessary in August, uh, sorry, in autumn and winter, the government could call for another lockdown. But I don't see them doing that. Not at this stage. Um, I, although there are worrying figures, right, of worrying figures in China. There's been an, a number of outbreaks of the Delta variant in China. Um, in Wuhan in particular, which is concerning. But I don't know if we have to worry about that yet. Uh, pandemic is lessening. In unrelated news, the app sensitivity was lowered. Ah. So it's not so... 
uh, this is my concern is that people will stop using the app or as you said the the government would decide to make the app less effective in a sense by lowering its sensitivity scientists now think the vaccines could be obsolete yeah this this is um says uh, kushti I'm I'm concerned about this as well because I saw a report from CNN I think it was about Israel and Israel rolled out the vaccine very early I think in January they had almost everyone vaccinated and they noticed that the over 60s who got the vaccine first in January are starting to see reinfection even though those people have had the two jabs and the infection rate, and they're seeing a sliding scale where the later, so the later uh, cases, sorry, the, the so, the, so let me try and explain this. Um, so in ja- people who are vaccinated in January are starting to get reinfected at a high rate. It's decreasing as we, as you go along the months. So people who are vaccinated in February, March, April, they're having fewer cases. The higher cases are the ones from the one from the the the, the people who received, or uh, at the same time as the people who received the first job back in January, um, which means that perhaps its effectiveness is wearing off. I don't know if that's true or not, but that seems to be uh, what's what came out of that report from CNN. Uh, the map, the app may well have been oversensitive initially. Although it's better to be oversensitive than undersensitive. Their immunity is down uh, to 18% after 16 months. To 18%, not by 18%. Even down by 18% would be pretty bad. It's down to 18%. That's extremely concerning. Uh, fact not fiction. Do you know if it's related to... And hi, fact not fact. Uh, fact not fiction good to see you on the stream um do you know if it if that's dependent on the type of vaccine like is it dependent on the the brand of mac- vaccine do they have booster shots do, booster jabs i don't think so so not yet but that would be the case of if the protection decreases we would need to have booster shots there is extreme negativity when mentioning england and anyone and anyone from sorry and everyone in italy knows that scotland was scuffed was stuffed and wish for independence 262 viewers and only 100 likes smash that like button guy remember guys remember you can support the channel by support smashing the like button you can support the channel by hitting me with a super chat and i'll read it out on the stream tonight you can also support the channel by becoming a patron or you can just share videos on social media it's a great way to support the channel too um in fact not fiction fact fact not fiction says it was a pfizer jab Wayne Frankenstein, nice name. Okay, let's let's move on. We'll move away from this for a bit, and I want to talk about Brexit, of course. <laughs> so, um, uh, Macron uh, already mentioned booster shots for the first vaccinated. Okay, Israel was Pfizer. So it says here, UK-backed plan to charge non-EU travellers to enter Europe. So you remember this story. Sir Ron was pretty upset about it as well. A lot of Brexiteers were not too happy. How dare the EU introduce uh, um, a tax, basically, on people coming from third countries. Although they didn't say third countries. They, they talked about people coming from Britain. Going on holiday from Britain into the EU. Um, now they'll have to pay this seven euro, I think it was. Or was it? Yeah, seven euro fee which you pay once and it lasts for three years i think or three journeys so it's not every time you go but it's seven euro okay it's not a huge amount of money i think uh, i was watching a video from phil from a different bias and he said you know you probably spend more than that just waiting in the queue you know on snacks or on drinks or whatever and you know for most people who've been to an airport they know that (laughs) you probably spend more you know, in the airport on snacks or on a meal than you do on the flight. 
Why is it so expensive in airports? I don't understand that. Maybe because you're you're trapped and you can you can't go anywhere else, so they they can fleece you. Anyway, uh, so the UK backed. So when the UK was a member, it supported this. It says here David Cameron's government said to have been one of the biggest supporters of the idea in 2016. So this plan to introduce a, f- a fee for people flying into the European Union or traveling into the European Union um, from third countries. This is hilarious. <laughs> so it says here, um, the British government was one of the biggest supporters of EU plans to introduce, to require non-EU nationals to obtain, obtain uh, authorization and pay a fee to enter the bloc's passport-free travel zone, the Guardian has learned. David Cameron's government backed the idea when it was floated by the European Commission in April 2016, three months before the EU referendum, which first saw the seven euro or five pounds ninety five pounds five pounds ninety five fee um, would one day hit British travellers. When few first saw, yes, uh, Brexit supporters reacted with fury this week when the when the Commission said said plans for the European travel information and authorization system were uh, were on track to come into uh, into force for travelers in late 2022 despite claims of brexit punishment the idea which is intended to increase border security long predates britain's eu divorce and applies to citizens from around 60 countries modeled on the us esta scheme non-eu citizens who do not require a visa will have to fill out a form and pay seven euros uh, before entering europe's passport free schengen zone in 95% of cases sorry in 95% of cases approval will be given within minutes if travel is allowed the fee the 7 euro fee which applies to adults between 18 and 70 year uh, 70 years covers multiple visits over 3 years yes that's it. so it covers visits over 3 years so it's not even 7 euro per per visit it's 7 euro over a number of years the former Labour MP, uh, MEP, uh, Claude Moray, said, Moray's said that the government had been keen on the idea. The UK government was one of the biggest supporters, obviously prior to the referendum, and ETAS was seen as part of a digital uh, securitization of borders that the UK wanted to lead on in the EU. Isn't it, isn't it interesting how engaged the British government used to be in Europe? Can you imagine if the referendum had gone the other way? Can you imagine if the, and it wasn't, you know, 52 to 47, it, if it had gone massively something like 60-40 or 70-30 uh, in support for remaining in the European Union. I, I think we would see a completely different Europe today and we'd see a completely different Britain today. Not just because Britain remained, but I think politicians would have read this as we need to be more engaged in Europe following that referendum result. But obviously, what ifs, you know. Uh, Thon, Thon, thank you. Thon, 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 thank you so much for that super chat. Um, is it for the UK to decide for the EU? <laughs> yes. It's like, you know, the person who leaves the gym, who got, you know, who has gym membership, they decide I no longer want to pay my gym membership. So they leave the gym and then they stand on the outside you know, shouting in, saying, you should be doing this or you should be doing that. <laughs> you shouldn't be charging people so much. You should be cleaning the f- facilities more often. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know. Oh, my God. Anyway, uh, Moraes Clay chaired the European Parliament's Home Affairs Committee, which was responsible for negotiating the Ipgis reg- ITAS regulation with EU interior ministers. The then, ho- the, the then Home Secretary, Theresa May, uh, was understood to have supported the concept, although she never expected to join because the UK was outside the Schengen zone. So, yeah, yes, this was not something that was going to apply to Britain anyway. Um, Britain supported it, but it was never going to apply because the UK is not part of Schengen and Ireland is not part of Schengen either. So it would never have affected Britain or Ireland. If the UK had remained an EU member, British nationals would uh, be exempt from filling out the form and charge a status 
uh, a special status that the non -E uh, non Schengen Ireland has today. Uh, so, what could have been, but now it's necessary to pay this fee. Not that it's a huge amount of money, but from a Brexit point of view, how is this a benefit? There is no benefit here. It's a cost. And it's just another thing we can mark down as something lost as a consequence of Brexit. The, the frustrating point of this as well is that certain Brexiteers, leading Brexiteers, probably have EU or Irish EU passports, so they're exempt from this as well. So Nigel Farage probably doesn't have to do this because he has an EU passport. Uh, Boris Johnson probably has an EU passport. I know his father does. Um, Nigel, sorry, uh, uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg probably has an Irish passport. Uh, or, I don't know, maybe not an Irish one, but he probably has an EU passport. He probably has a villa somewhere in the south of France. So he has. Um, he probably applied for a, a, a French passport some years ago. So these people are not going to be affected by it. They can just pass the queue. So I hope any Brexiteer in the future, and I'm talking about people who voted for Brexit and still think it's a good idea, if they're sitting in the airport queuing to get their visa checked and they see Jacob Rees-Mogg walk past um, into the into the EU line, for example, EU citizen line, um, I wonder what they'll think. Will they be happy? Uh, I love the irony of Brexit. One rule for them, a different for rule for us, yes. Uh, David Cameron will be a textbook example of how not to manage a country and international negotiations. <laughs> Come on, Max, just one villa. Get serious. <laughs> Sorry, silly me. Uh, one one villa in each province, perhaps. <laughs> what EU passport has Farage? Uh, I think he probably has a German passport because his wife is German. And I, I, I really don't know. I imagine he has a German passport. He's probably applied for one. But this is before Brexit. I imagine he had one before Brexit. Um, he knew things were coming and he said, I better be prepared. Uh, Nigel Farage le uh, left, wi left white his hands clean. Uh, what an elitist. Farage was refused a German passport, I thought. I, I don't know. I, 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 would, I just assume that he does have a, pas a, a European passport. Why can't Farage just be quiet? Because Farage is a grifter. Farage wants attention. Farage, um, also, Farage hasn't received his EU pension yet, which would be over a hundred thousand pounds, I think, per year. Um, so he hasn't received his pension yet. He'll have to wait until he's of age. I don't know what it is, sixty-five or seventy. I'm not sure. I'm not even sure how old Nigel Farage is. He must be getting close to it. So until he receives his pension, he's trying to make some money on the side. You know, doing. Uh, tours with, with Donald Trump, um, rallies with Donald Trump, going on Fox News, GB News. He probably got a, a, a lorry load of money to go on GB News because it was crashing and burning and they brought him on. I don't know if it's actually made that much of an impact. Um, I was looking at some of the videos on Twitter and they have lots of views, but the channel on YouTube doesn't have a lot of views. It's not massive the last time I checked. And um, he's 67. Okay, so it must be well, he's, he must be close to I don't know what retirement age is for members of the European Parliament. Uh, the Germans have a thing about giving fascist passports. <laughs> the very idea that uh, the very idea to have more than one nationality is fundamentally wrong unless you intend in inherited it. Yes. Um, because if you have two nationalities, generally, I'm not saying everyone, but generally, it's about profiting from something. It's not actually that you give a crap about either country. 
10,000 reasons. I've not seen uh, GB News yet. <laughs> Good for you. Um, <laughs> where can we donate to his pension? <laughs> oh no, just because he'll, he'll have a pension doesn't mean he'll be off the air, but he'll be probably on the air less. You know, he. All of these things are about promoting himself. When he goes, you know, migrant watching and when he's um, chauffeur driven around in his Range Rover, you know, to harass mem you know, rip refugees in hotels um, because generally they're in hotels because there's nowhere else for them to go you know the the right wing like to say oh look at them being put up in luxury hotels they're put up in hotels because there's nowhere else for them to go um, they're generally put sometimes in in disused army barracks that haven't been used in like 20 years and um, they don't have the proper facilities available um, that are against standards of uh, you know hu human rights standards uh, so they're put in in a place where they have access to food access to clean water access to a bed access to heating for example uh, where do you find these generally in hotels and if hotels are empty it's cheaper for well it's in a sense cheaper for the government just to put the people up there book 10,000 rooms in a number of hotels around the country and then just put put them all in there. And it also keeps them away from the general public because unfortunately if you have a camp um it it tends to attract protests if if you want to put it that way. And the likes of Farage and others who like to turn up and complain and and other such individuals. Anyway, we're getting a, a bit sidetracked here. I want to move on to another uh, topic from, related to Brexit, of course. Um, wow, Johan, thank you so much for that super chat. Why why the problem with EU uh, have the same arrangements as US with the uh, with the ESTA? Because it's the EU is evil. <laughs> the USA is cool, but the EU is evil. Basically, that's what it comes down to, Johan. Thanks again for that super chat. It's the Brexiteers don't like Europe. So if the United States do something that's exactly the same as uh, the European Union, then the Brexiteers don't have a problem with it. But if the European Union do something that's exactly the same as the Euro the United States, then they have a problem with it. It's all it's they're anti-European. Um, and also, I think there's a little bit of racism in there as well. You know, the Americans are like us; they speak the same language. Um, Uh, but the French and the Germans, we don't understand them. Uh, we don't like those people, even though they are closer to us, even though in some ways we have more in common uh, with these people. No, we prefer the Americans, we prefer the Australians, we prefer the New Zealanders, we prefer uh, South Africans, some South Africans, of course. Not, I don't think Brexiteers like all South Africans, but uh, there's generally this idea that uh, we, want, we want to be... Uh, we're, we're friendly with people who look more like us. Brexiteers don't like the EU. They love Europe. Yeah, right. <laughs> I love that argument. They say, you know, I'm I'm, I'm anti-EU, not anti-Europe. I say, okay, well, what is the European Union? Uh, it's European nations working together. So, anyway, Europe is... A geographical location you can say i love you when you say if you say i love europe then you're talking about the mountains or the the lakes or the the rivers or the 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 look the the beaches or whatever the physical location but europe is when we're talking about the european union we're talking about the people so you you like the landscape but you hate the people basically I want an evil unicorn. <laughs> um, is that another name for a Brexiteer? An evil unicorn. Brexit will uh, Brexit will end with the UK. Average temperature is forty. Uh, then Brexit will be somehow to blame, not global warming. I don't. I, I don't see Brexit ever being blamed. Even Brexiteers, when they see things going badly, they'll say Brexit is a success. But Remainers are to blame for it. <laughs> it's 
they, they hold these two ideas in their head that Brexit is both a success and a failure. But if it's a success, it's because, well, it's intrinsically a, a success. It's intrinsically good. Brexit is intrinsically good. If it's a failure, it's because Remainers have gotten in the way. It's because it's been undermined. It's it's something that is perfect. But any sort of defect is not because of Brexit. It's because of what somebody has uh, used to undermine Brexit or it's a, it's a politician acting outside the spirit of Brexit. If you start off from the idea that Brexit is perfect, then you'll never be able to criticise it. And any sort of criticism that's levelled at Brexit, you'll say it's nothing to do with Brexit. That's where a lot of these people, that's, how they, that's where they stand on this. And it's difficult to reason with somebody like that because they, they'll never take the position that Brexit could ever be not perfect. How do you argue with somebody whose position is, my position is always right? That's why I, say, that's why I sometimes compare it to a religious cult. If you ever debate somebody who or try to talk to somebody who's a, mem- a member of a religious cult, the great leader, the dear leader, or the, or whoever the founder of that cult is, that person is perfect, and anything they do that seems imperfect is because of somebody else's influence or somebody else uh, trying to stop them from achieving their goals. But the the leader is always perfect, and then you see what some of these leaders get up to, because they because their followers believe they're perfect. And Brexit is like that. Uh, I'm not I'm not to blame because I don't want to drive a lorry. <laughs> I, I'm really concerned about what's going to happen with the with the, the lorries. Um, things are going to get worse for a period. The uh, some some people are going to so at the moment a lot of lorry drivers are on holiday because of the summer. They're going to return. But the problem also is that a lot of um, uh, demand will start to increase as well. And I don't know if there's enough, um, enough, there are enough lorry drivers available to meet the demand. So it says staff and material shortages show slow growth in UK construction sector. Some, I just want to say another thing about this is that during... Many times uh, you'll hear Brexiteers, for example, the older generation will say, well, back before we became a member of the European Union, we didn't have any of these problems. And they seem to forget that the economy grew enormously from 1973 on. And what happened was because the economy grew, the population grew uh, and people had access to more things. Because people had access to more things, there was greater demand on infrastructure, on logistics, and those aspects of society, like infrastructure and logistics, expanded, developed with the growth of the economy. Now, when you take away something like that, then you start to have problems. If you start, if you take away the infrastructure, you don't have the drivers to uh, uphold the back, the backbone of society, the backbone of the economy. Then things start to collapse, and you can't go back to the way it was before because it was completely different before. You had a smaller population. You had people who were willing to accept uh, a smaller selection in the supermarkets. There are hundreds of types of food that you can find today in your in your local supermarket that was impossible to find, was in, unthinkable before 1973. And it's not just food, it can be a whole range of products. So as the economy grew, uh, our uh, the infrastructure, the logistics, uh, everything expanded with it. And once you deflate one part, you're left with a, a gaping hole. Uh, Draconic, thank you so much for that super chat. Evil Unicorn is a rhino. Nothing to do with Republicans, actually. <laughs> On second thoughts. <laughs> Yeah, it's like Brino as well, Brexit in name only. <laughs> uh, thanks very much for that super chat. Um, so it says here, Britain's uh, builders struggling to keep pace with the demand for new homes and maintenance work in July. A shortage of materials and skilled staff slows growth. 
slowed growth, according to a close-watched industry survey. After hitting a 24-year high in June, the construction industry last month grew at its slowest pace since February, after firms that had stockpiled materials in the first half of the year began to run low while others were unable to find enough workers to fulfill um, bulging order books. So a lot of people are, of course, um, doing upgrades on their homes. New homes are to be built. Boris Johnson talked about building tens of thousands of new homes. But the problem is there aren't there, there aren't the staff and there isn't the materials available. Analysts said that the future looked rosy for much of the industry as uh, the economy reopened and the consistently high level of growth was established was likely to be to be to re-establish itself once the pressure on supply lines began to ease. The INS market uh, clips chips sips <laughs> I don't know UK construction. A purchasing index, uh, managers index dipped to 58.7 percent, 58.7 I should say points, in July. The score still represents growth above anything above 50 is considered positive, but noted uh, which showed a notable slowdown after June 66.3. More than eight in ten businesses said that they had seen prices for raw materials and other costs rise over the period. Only 1 in 100 said costs fell in July. Higher prices combined with shortages of cement, copper and steel to to delay some projects that are already underway and some planned projects in industry business said. Two thirds of businesses said that they had to wait longer for delays, putting this down to Brexit friction, congestion at ports and a shortage of transport. An assessment of the industry by the surveyor's body RICS found that 82% of firms said the shortage of materials hampered the market during the second quarter, up from 57% previously. Moreover, the cost of materials is expected to increase by nearly 10% over the next 12 months. So I'm going to talk about also a bit later in the stream about how um, rising costs are affecting ordinary people as well. So... Whoops, not sure what happened there. Okay, move on. Let me read some of your comments. I hate politicians. Um, there we go. PMI is a useful indicator. Um, QA Library says the UK grain harvest is being delayed due to no truck drivers. Farmers cannot get uh, harvest grain off the field. And if they are out of storage, the fields cannot be harvested. And QA Library is in contact with some people who are in the know when it comes to uh, haulage so this is concern- so this is going to lead to if grain is not being harvested there's it's likely to cause um, delays in the production of, of flour of course uh, which will create problems with the production of bread uh, big phil english patriot <laughs> proud unionist thank you so much for that super chat kanzuk must happen a grand imperial <laughs> federation <laughs> <laughs> yes, Kanzuk. So is it Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand and UK working together? Um, the only slight tiny downside of that big fill, thanks once again for that super chat, is that the location of each of these member states. <laughs> and isn't it interesting how the UK said we want to leave big blocks. We don't want to be part of these big blocks and we're going we and some brexiteers would like to join another block be it tcp tcptp or whatever it is um or kanzuk for example so staying once again with fishing uh, sorry with brexit it says here pm urged to stem the hemorrhage of foreign fishing workers so has the fishing industry not suffered enough and now they don't have enough workers so beginning of the year they had workers but they had no market now they have no market and no workers fishing leaders have urged the prime minister to stem the hemorrhage of foreign workers in the industry following brexit oh my god boris johnson said uh, along with the business secretary um quasi koatang i am terrible at pronouncing names apologies to him uh second uh, scotland office minister david uh, Dugaid and Scottish Tory leader Douglas Ross 
met with the heads of a number of fishing organizations on Thursday. Oh, so Boris Johnson has finally met with the fishing <laughs> organizations. What is it? It's now August. Yes. Just, you know, how long have they been suffering? Yeah, I'll wait seven months, over seven months, and then I'll talk to them. Uh, Nico, thank you so much for that super chat. Um, when can we expect all those dinghies back on our shores in the EU? <laughs> well, if Boris Johnson continues as Prime Minister, it could happen a lot sooner than we imagine. Thanks again for that super chat. Jan, thank you again for that super chat. We have a seven euro entry fee. Entry charge will will proof Brexit is wrong straight away. There isn't enough uh, building material even in the EU. Why would they want to move it to the UK? Just checked in Poland and Czech Republic. Um, there's also another problem that popped up on my newsfeed. Uh, thanks for that, Jan, as well. Um, another problem rel related to building materials is that there, have, there are checks to be carried out on timber. So timber has to be checked. And this is causing delays. Now, it's, it's also has to be checked when it's going into the UK. Now, we know that some products are being waived through. The checks are not being carried out. But on timber, it seems that the checks do have to be carried out. And this is causing delays as well. Just when these uh, this industry needs this uh, material. And it goes on to say here, uh, the Scottish S Seafood Association, which campaigned for Brexit, I think, Chief Executive... Jim Bu uh, uh, Buchan uh, pressed the Prime Minister and on the number of staff lost to the industry as a result of Brexit, which has dramatically reduced the number of seasonal workers in Scotland and had an impact on the seafood sector. Yeah, so it's not just fishermen, but also those who work within the industry processing this fish for sale in the, in the market. And it's not just the fish that's exported, which is a problem, but it's also fish that's for domestic consumption. Uh, Mr. Buchan said, I, I sought an insur uh, assurance from the government would work closely with us to resolve this, resolve the critical uh, shortage of labour. Yes, an assurance from Boris Johnson's government. It's as useful as an assurance from Sir Ron Venti. He uh, he, are, he agreed that he agreed. He agreed that the campaign was required. Uh, a campaign was required to encourage young people into the industry and on the need for direct action to stem the hemorrhaging, the hemorrhage of overseas workers that has occurred since January the first. See, this is the response to encourage young people into the industry. See, the problem with working in the fishing industry is that it's really frigging difficult. It's a lot of people don't want to do it. Like if it's on a boat, you have to spend hours and hours, maybe even days on a boat in the middle of the sea. Um, it can be dangerous, backbreaking, and generally it's not very well paid. Or you can work in a fish processing plant, uh, which can be dangerous because you're working with uh, you know, knives and uh, dangerous dangerous machines um back breaking and generally not very well paid like the alternative is to increase wages to encourage people to come in by paying them uh, higher salaries higher wages but that's not going to happen because it would cost the consumer more and if the uk decides we're going to open up the market for fish because of brexit you know, ending all these these uh, protections for the fishing industry, um, then it's going to make fish in the UK more expensive, produced in the UK more expensive. So the custom, the consumer will buy the cheaper one, the imported one. Uh, Mr. Buchan uh, also was all was sorry was also among the sector leaders to tell the Prime Minister that the Brexit deal had fallen far short of expectations. The sector now delays. The sector saw delays in exporting goods with red tape imposed by the by the, the deal caused tailbacks at Dover. The deal also allowed EU fisher, uh, fishermen into UK waters until 2026. Uh, um, 
Aspeth MacDonald, the chief executive of the Sc- uh, Scottish Fishermen's Federation, said the Prime Minister had a duty to support the sector between now and when the access of EU fishermen expires. And then we have Boris Johnson, you know, in front of a boat. The Prime Minister had previously spoken of the El Dorado of fish beyond 2026 onwards, but we are seeking commitment from him to deliver much uh, better opportunities for the Scottish fleet in the meantime, as well as in the long term, she said. Let me close this. Uh, Big Phil, thank you so much for that super chat. Uh, can we not get seasonal workers um, from the rush? <laughs> no, I don't think it's. I don't. I don't think that's possible at the moment. <laughs> you could, but how are you going to get them all over? And um, and then the problem with that is that even if you could get people from from the east, from parts of the empire, um, the Brexiteers wouldn't be very happy because they'd see all these foreign people hanging around, uh, you know, staying in, in accommodation and bumping into them at their local supermarket and the Brexiteers voted to stop that. So, <laughs> unfortunately, no. <laughs> uh, thanks very much for that super jet, though. Boris, let's wait five years for it. <laughs> Basically, yes, like he's not going to do anything. Fishing was used as a cudgel against the European Union. It was used as a trick for the public. Convince the public that we're going to use fishing as the as the issue that's going to separate us from Theresa May or this is Boris Johnson of course. Um, fishing is so important we're going to put it front and center and then and leave everything else aside. And when the deal came in the fishing industry was not protected. Like you could understand if he had found a good deal for the fishermen, but he didn't, even though he had spent a year negotiating pretty much only on that. In the short term, it will be a case of survival for the industry, but we want to thrive and to ensure that we can build back this industry. We need to start planning now. The prime minister and the business secretary visited an uh, offshore wind farm in the North Sea after the Fraser Burr uh, meeting, where Ms. Uh, Ms. McDonald raised the issue of off- offshore renewables. More renewable energy is clearly vital in the fight against climate change, but we need also to recognize that fish is a healthy protein uh, foodstuff with a very low carbon footprint compared to other animal and plant-based sources. I'm not sure about that. The wind blows in many, um, in many more places than fish swim, and if both sectors are uh, both sectors to flourish, decisions must be made to allow us to coexist successfully. Um, look, Boris Johnson doesn't care about the environment. He pretends to care about the environment. We've seen how he has said that he's not going to tear up a contract that was signed for an oil field in, near the Shetlands. So. If he was willing to tear up the Northern Ireland Protocol and the withdrawal agreement to keep Brexiteers happy, but he won't tear up a contract to keep the environment happy. Isn't that strange? Uh, no, fish aren't better than carbon f- than plants. For carbon than plants. Yeah, a, a vegetarian or vegan diet is probably the best for the environment. Um... You know, if you eat a lot of meat, you should probably eat more fish. It's better if you, if from an envir- environmental point of view. If you're not going to become vegetarian or vegan, it's better to eat maybe fish um, or there are other types of meat. But fish is not some sort of panacea here. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, as well as the lack of fishing opportunities, the industry faces um, a spatula sque- squeeze as o- offshore wind grows. No, I don't see how that's the case. The wind, uh, the wind blows on many other places. Oh no, sorry, I've already read that. Um, so the government says that we've committed up to twenty-three million to support fisheries, fishery businesses in Scotland and across the UK, and a further one hundred million has been directed to rejuvenating, rejuvenating. 
rejuvenating the industry and coastal communities in the long term. Uh, we will continue to work closely with the industry and help them access the labor they need. But there is no labor. That's the problem. Uh, there is a huge source available in Europe, but you don't want that. So it's unfortunately, and I don't know why, but many within the Scottish fishing industry voted for Brexit. They campaigned along with the Brexiteers for Brexit. And they um, were thrown under a bus by Boris Johnson and the Brexiteers. And instead of accepting that and being critical of Boris Johnson and Brexit, they preferred just to say, well, the deal was bad. and uh, We should have gotten a better deal. But that doesn't fix the problem. But they'll still turn around and, and vote for the Conservative Party. That's why Douglas Ross is there, to make sure that they, the fisher remember. Remember, you, you have to vote for the Tories. Don't vote for the SNP or don't vote for the Labour Party or the Greens. OK, Max, put away the, bud, the baby sham. OK, OK, let's move on. Uh, well, we're actually halfway through the stream, so I'll take a little break. Um, it's not for me to, to top myself up. <laughs> but uh, this should be funny. I hope you enjoy this uh, funny video. And then we'll get back to the serious stuff in a moment. Uh, let me read more of your comments before we jump to that. Plant-based food production has a pretty huge environmental hit compared to uh, the land that's on, the, having the land uh, as untouched forest. So the fish carbon footprint thing could very well be true. See, a lot of the a lot of fish produced today is not actually caught from the sea. It's actually produced on in fish farms, either on land. Um, or in in the sea itself, which is not very uh, environmentally friendly. We have this idea that you know the fishermen go out in a boat and they catch a fish with a net. Uh, most fish that we consume isn't produced that way. Douglas Ross has a look of, <laughs> I'm shafting you all here and you can't stop me. <laughs> or maybe he's thinking. Can we hurry up? Because I I have a game to referee tonight. <laughs> uh, Douglas Ross and Boris Johnson, they met fishermen who put in their place <laughs> those nasty shellfish men. Ross would like to be an old fisherman's friend, <laughs> but his bassless notions have bream unless uh, the bends. <laughs> wow, <laughs> very good. So many fish puns in there, more than you can shake a, uh, a fishing rod at uh, check out sea spiracy yes do check that out because it, it explains how the fishing industry works and the impact it's having so let's um take a break from the serious stuff and enjoy this funny video if it works yes before granting you entry to the republic of ireland i just have a few simple questions it's just a formality name three irish rivers uh, river Shannon, the River Liffey, and the River Dance. Correct. When is summer in Ireland? The 15th to the 23rd of July. Correct. What are Ireland's national sports? Uh, Gaelic football, hurling, and binge drinking. Correct. What is Ireland's national dish? Nyhorn. He is. What are the two predominant religions in Ireland? Man United and Liverpool. They are. How many counties are there in Ireland? 22. How many accents are there in Ireland? 2,000. Yes. The current Irish government is a coalition of which three parties? Apple, Facebook and Google. Yes. Name the area with the highest Irish population density. London. Correct. What time zone does Ireland run on? Five minutes past when it should be. Yes. Where will you go if you defraud the government in Ireland? Prison. Where will you go if you defraud the taxpayer in Ireland? Spain. Yes. Who came to power following Irish independence from Great Britain? The Catholic Church. They did. What is Ireland's biggest export? Nurses. What is Ireland's biggest import? Landlords. What is the current street value of crack in Ireland? 90. The crack is 90. Now for the Irish language section. Cackler er What? Cackler er Sorry, I, I don't speak Irish, so... Jesus. Okay, now for the practical. Please pour a pint of Guinness from this can. No, wait. Never drink Guinness from a can. Correct. Welcome to Ireland, lads. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> okay, let's move on. 
Oops, no. Boris Johnson has promised okay. a smooth and sensible. Land noises. <laughs> okay, so this is in regards to Boris Johnson made some comments about Margaret Thatcher and Margaret Thatcher making an early start on climate change. So what Margaret Thatcher did during the 1980s was to basically destroy the trade unions and their power um, and close the mines under the idea that it was, uh, well, Boris Johnson tried to present it as it was an environmental, <laughs> it was on environmental grounds. And um, the problem with that argument is that later the UK continued to import coal to burn in power stations and in industry. So it wasn't an environmental objective that um, Margaret Thatcher had. Margaret Thatcher is not the very first person that comes to mind when I think of environmental protection. She wasn't the Greta Thunberg of the 1980s, okay? <laughs> ...will shift from fossil fuels to renewable power, but the PM has been criticised for his comments today, claiming that Margaret Thatcher had given the UK an early start in the fight against climate change when coal mines across the UK were closed in the 1980s. Well, let's get more on that with Sky's chief political correspondent, John Craig. So let me get this straight then, John. Boris Johnson's thesis is that Margaret Thatcher was an early advocate of action on the climate. Well, some of her supporters have claimed this, that, that it's uh, climate change uh, warning was uh, her, a forgotten legacy. She made a big speech <laughs> at the... <laughs> really? Margaret Thatcher. So that was she, she said we have to close all these coal mines because it's bad for the environment. Really? <laughs> That's like saying, you know, uh, Mao, you know, decimated his population because he he didn't like people, I don't know, reading too much or something. <laughs> like what the hell? The United Nations in uh, 1989 warning about climate change and global warming. In actual fact, it was because the Green Party uh, had polled 15% uh, of the votes in the European elections in uh, 1989, really shocked the Tory party. Now, what the Prime Minister has said in a briefing to uh, uh, journalists up in Scotland, off-camera, print journalists, uh, he said on uh, the whole issue of wind power and getting away from fossil fuels, look at what we've done already. We've transitioned away from coal in my lifetime. Thanks to Margaret Thatcher, who closed so many coal mines across the country, we had a big early start. And now, we're now moving rapidly away from coal altogether. Now... See, the problem with that is that what did she replace the industries with? Did she say, OK, we're going to move away from coal to renewable energy and we're going to create jobs in the renewable energy industry? Now, what... Renewable energy actually creates more jobs than fossil fuel, the fossil fuel industry. So by installing solar panels on people's homes, making turbines, setting them up, maintaining them, this actually creates many more jobs than the coal industry has ever produced. And, of course, safer jobs. Um, it doesn't affect your health unless you coal mine, coal mine workers have suffered long-term health problems by working in the mines and those working near the mines as well. And then, of course, there are the issues of fires and explosions within the mines, which have killed uh, not just miners, but also people within the vicinity as well. Extremely dangerous, extremely unenvironmentally friendly, and instead we can have renewable energy, we can have new renewable sources, and that's what we should be moving towards because it creates jobs. It creates money for the local economy as well. Um, then why the hell did Boris Johnson say that he's not going to tear up a contract to allow the exploration of gas and oil near the Shetlands if he cares about the environment? It is claimed by those present that when he mentioned Margaret Thatcher closing the coal mines, he laughed and then said to the journalists, I thought that would get you going. Anyway, that, the laughter, uh, and, uh, has uh, outraged many politicians as much as the remark itself. Sir Keir Starmer has said on Twitter, Boris Johnson's shameful praising of Margaret Thatcher's closure of the coal mines, brushing off the devastating impact on those communities with a laugh, shows just how out of touch he is with working people. Nicola Sturgeon has accused him of being crass and insensitive. Now, 
But, but crass and insensitive and, and insensitive are Boris Johnson's middle names. Um, Regan Ali, thanks so much for that super chat. Let's not um, let's not talk. Let's not talk about the government wanting to open a coal mine in Cumbria. Okay, mainstream media. Yes, how, how could I have missed that? There is a plan for the the government to open a a new coal mine in Cumbria, and it's been it's been highlighted as an environmental disaster by environmental groups. But we're going to open it anyway. Look, we're moving away from coal, but we're going to you know keep a few on the side to make sure that we have enough. Uh, what? <laughs> like, how can you say we're our plan is to move in this direction? towards renewable energy but we're going to maintain or open a new uh, coal mine every number of years now i don't know the the full story here of what's happening in cumbria i can imagine somebody's making money out of it and that's why it's there maybe somebody who has donated to the conservative party most people looking back at the 80s would say hold on a minute it wasn't about the environment it was about uh, crushing the miners about uneconomic pits do you remember she used that phrase the enemy within um it was all about a battle with the unions uh, the, the the environment wasn't mentioned at the time at all um so boris johnson i think he's got this wrong and he probably realized his claim is a bit ridiculous in fact he laughed uh, and perhaps made things worse anyway predictable row from the uh, political opponents the Tories will worry a bit more, though, about the impact of these remarks in those red wall constituencies, many of whom, many of which were former mining communities where the Tories won seats at the last election. But unfortunately, I don't think it's going to harm Boris Johnson too much, even in the red wall seats, because vaccine rollout, get Brexit done. A lot of the, the people have probably moved on, or a lot of the younger generation never suffered uh, or never experienced what was happening under Margaret Thatcher. So they have no real emotional connection to the mining community or the the mines themselves. Or they perhaps they're related to miners, ex-miners, but I think the, the majority of people there probably just wanted to get Brexit done and Boris Johnson said, I'll get it done. And they voted for him on that on that basis. So I just want to show you a bit more about that um, from this article in The Guardian. Let me open it up here. So Keir Starmer calls on Boris Johnson to say sorry for coal mine's joke. Boris Johnson will not say sorry. Or what he'll probably do is he'll say, I'm sorry if somebody found my words offensive. <laughs> it's not, I'm sorry if you're offended. Not I'm sorry that I offended. Uh, or I'm, not, I'm sorry for what I said. No, I'm sorry if you were offended. Um, typical non non apology. Uh, you can fool some of the people all of the time. <laughs> yes, Margaret Thatcher looks stunning. <laughs> yes, but why no why no nipples in the Daily Express? <laughs> what? <laughs> um, perhaps Hitler foresaw the <laughs> foreseen could could foresee the Palestinian problem. My God, yes. <laughs> um, Johnson can't help himself really. Now, it's all a big joke to him. He, see, I've said this before. Boris Johnson treats Parliament, he treats his role as Prime Minister as being head of some sort of exclusive club at Eton. He still thinks he's at Eton, where Keir Starmer is the, the guy, you know, on the other team, the other debating team. And it's about debating. It's about, you know, trying to get one over on the other team. Uh, and that's that's the way Boris Johnson operates. It's all a joke to him. It's all a big game. It's all him messing about like he was in Eton. And there are real consequences for that, obviously. And we've seen that. So when he says, oh, it's a, you know, he makes a joke about the lives of uh, these people, he has no sensitivity whatsoever. He has no empathy. This is the guy who, who allegedly burnt a 20 or 50 pound note in front of a homeless person in order to get into the Bullington Club. Like, why would you want to be part of a club that requires you to burn a 50 pound note or 20 pound note, whatever, burn anything in front of a homeless person? What, what does that say about an individual who wants to be, who, who does that? 
Is that not enough for people? As soon as people discovered he did something like that, is that not enough to say, I don't want anything to do with it. How would I vote for this individual? I've tried to find humanity within Boris Johnson. I, I thought perhaps there would be some humanity within him when he went into hospital. But there isn't. It's about Boris Johnson only. It's about protecting Boris Johnson, about protecting um, his position. He doesn't give a crap about anyone. He doesn't give a crap about the Conservative Party. He doesn't give a crap about the environment. It's all about him. It's, it's like him and... Donald Trump were separated at birth or something. Or Boris, well, he's Boris, Boris is somewhat younger. Maybe he's some sort of love child of Donald Trump. I don't know. Because they're pretty much the same character-wise. So Keir Starmer has called on uh, Boris Johnson to uh, apologise for joking about Margaret Thatcher's closing coal mines, describing the remarks as utterly shameful. Uh, the, prime, the Labour leader... Prime Minister, I almost said, uh, who represented the, the National Union of Mine Workers, NUM, in court over the pit closers orchestrated by the Tories in the 1980s, accused the Prime Minister of being out of touch. I think this is something that they really need to bang on about. I think the Labour Party should use this. Take, hold an image of Boris Johnson laughing, put it next to laughing at your expense, laughing at your uh, situation and run with it at the next election have pollsters of Boris Johnson laughing at the people in the north laughing at the 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 workers because you you may not be able to convert everyone but you should be able to flip a few people some people who maybe voted for Johnson over Brexit maybe they don't like the way that he has treated and the Tories in general have treated uh, their relatives Maybe they voted for Brexit, but they're having double th uh, second thoughts over whether to support the Conservatives again. Maybe this could be something that could uh, flip a switch in their mind. Johnson drew outrage on Thursday when he claimed Thatcher had given the UK an early start in the shift away from fossil fuels by closing pits and followed up by laughing about it. Uh, in a video on Twitter, Starmer said, "I stood up to the by the I stood by the miners uh, under the Tories, and I stand uh, by their commit uh, the communities. Now these communities contributed so much to the success of our country, and then they were abandoned. The Tories don't care then. The, the Tories didn't care then, and they don't care now. To treat the pain and suffering caused uh, uh, to our coal mine communities as a punchline." Shows just how to, out of touch Boris Johnson is. The Prime Minister must apologise immediately. Um, earlier Downing Street uh, declined to apologise for the remarks but said Johnson recognised the huge impact and pain that was felt by communities at the time. <laughs> Does anyone, anyone truly believe this? Boris Johnson recognised the huge pain and impact the pain. Boris Johnson recognises other people's pain. Boris Johnson doesn't recognise other people, never mind their pain. His remarks were also criticised by the Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon and the Welsh First Minister Mark Drakeford, Drakeford um, as well as provoking a backlash amongst um, some of his own Tory MPs. Three mayors representing millions of people across former coal, um, coal fields in Northern England said uh, voters would feel if they were being treated with utter contempt by the Prime Minister. Dan Jarvis, the mayor of Sheffield City Region, said Thatcher's destruct uh, destruction of the coal mine industry left a trail of devastation across the Yorkshire field coal fields uh, without a thought for the people and the communities that were so deeply affected as a consequence. We're still picking up the pieces uh, to this day. Boris Johnson choosing to laugh about the destructive legacy tells you all you need to know. Tracy Brabin the mayor of West, uh, West Yorkshire said Johnson had shown his lack of understanding of the devastating impact clo uh, pit closures had on our communities in West Yorkshire. I'm looking forward to, I, I hope Phil is making a video on this. I, I don't know if he's already made one today, but I, I hope he's doing a video on this because he's from this area. And I'd like to know how what he has to think because he, he knows this area much better than I could ever know it. Um, and the impact it's had in the the closure of these mines both on you know the workers themselves and the community as a whole and how they are going to react to 
to Boris Johnson. I th- look, I, th- I think people should start talking about it in those areas. P- you know, in the supermarket, ask people. That's what the Labour Party should be doing. Ask them, what do you think of the Prime Minister laughing about this? Plant a seed. Yeah, I voted for him for Brexit, but I don't like the way he, t- he talked about us. Uh, and do you think he cares about you if he, if he made comments like that? Uh, probably not. Are you going to vote for him again? Probably not. <laughs> or maybe I will. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how you respond to these people. Uh, as the backlash grew on Friday, the Prime Minister's uh, spokesperson declined to offer any regret for his words. The government has an ambitious plan to tackle the, the, cri- uh, the critical issue of climate change, which includes reducing reliance on coal and other non-re- non-renewable energy sources. Yeah, yes, Boris Johnson laughed about people suffering, but we're, we care, we have an ambitious plan. During the visit, the Prime Minister pointed to the huge uh, progress already made in the UK, transitioning away from coal and towards cleaner forms of energy and our commitment to supporting people and industries on the transi- um, on that transition. Sturgeon said lives and communities across Scotland have been utterly devastated by Thatcher's destruction of the coal, coal industry, adding it had zero to do with any, imp- uh, any concern she had for the planet. Martin Gannon, a Labour leader in Gateshead Council, said Boris's comments are a bit like saying the harrowing of the North by William the Conqueror was just his way of decreasing the supply, po- the surplus population and introducing modern security measures. <laughs> Very well said. Um, needless to say, Boris's experience and knowledge of the social and economic consequences of Thatcher Thatcher's decarbonisation programme on the former um, coalfield communities can easily be written on the head of a pin. <laughs> uh, I'd love to have a, a live stream with Martin. If someone can get me on with uh, to do <laughs> a live stream, he sounds like a, a, a guy who would have some interesting things to say. Uh, Simon Greaves, the le- Labour leader of uh, Bassett's Law Council, said areas like his had seen uh, it's still coming through the legacy of deindustrialization forced by the Conservatives and was furious that they were being treated as the butt of a joke by the Prime Minister. This is a subject that still runs deep in the minds of local people. They have been uh, outraged by his comments and they can't believe he- the insensitivity. Um, well, I can believe it. Boris Johnson is a prick. And he will. He, he doesn't have the ability to think, OK, how is what I'm going to say impacting on people? It's all a joke to him. As I've said, it's like him. He, he still believes he's in Eton, some debating club, debating team, I should say. And it's all just a bit of fun. And he's probably upset as well because he's not earning as much money as he was before. You know, he's earning only, what is it, £150,000? How, how is he supposed to survive on only £150,000 a year? You know, he's he's pretty depressed at the moment because he's, he's earning only £150,000 a year. So I want to show you this. Oh, I didn't, didn't have the video link. Uh, no, here it is, yes. So, moving on from the topic of Boris Johnson earning £150,000 a year and not being happy about it, I want to talk about the cost of living. Um, but let me read some of your comments first. Insensitive did Priti Patel say, not say, starve the Irish into submission? Yes, that was one of the Brexit um, bargaining tools that uh, the Brexiteers wanted to use was to starve Ireland. Um, so that they would force the EU to give Britain a better deal or something like that. Gutless prick. <laughs> um, will the Labour will Labour get down and dirty in the street fight with the conserv- at the Conservatives um, in an all and out level attack at the next election? Not sure if they'll do that. Uh, Vicky, thanks so much for that kind comment. Uh, enjoying your videos. At fact and fiction. Uh, mine too, I hope. <laughs> um, sorry, that was for fact and fiction, not for me. Um, will Labour get down and dirty? I don't think so. I'm afraid not. I don't think Keir Starmer is the person. Now, Keir Starmer could outsource it um, 
delegate that task to someone else, which would be probably the best approach. But him himself, I don't see him getting down and dirty. I wish he did. I wish that we could see a more human side to Keir Starmer. I've said before that he should, from time to time, let loose, uh, rant, become aggressive, become angry, show his anger, show his humanity. Because, you know, we're human. We, we get angry when we see injustice, when we see things that uh, we, want, we can't fix. He can't fix the problems. He, he should get angry. I think more and more people would listen, would sit up and listen if, if Keir Starmer came across a bit more human. Um, he's too professional. He's too polished. I think he should act a bit more like John Prescott, maybe. <laughs> maybe not a good example, but a bit more human, a um, bit more aggressive. Drop a few F-bombs. Like, for fuck's sake, Boris, get your finger out. The people are dying here. Something like imagine if he said something like that. Um, he he would get berated in in the media. But imagine the publicity. People who don't know who Keir Starmer would be would be watching this video of him saying this. People would be um, talking about him. That's what you want. What did pe Why did people vote for Boris Johnson? Because they thought he was a bit of a buffoon. No, not John Brascott. <laughs> he was a bit of a buffoon. People voted for Boris Johnson because he's rough around the edges. He's fake, of course. It's all a, a, a charade. But it worked. And I'm not talking about Keir Starmer putting on a charade. I'm talking about Keir Starmer acting like a human being. He needs to do something. He needs to get down and dirty, in a sense. More like AOC, yes. AOC is an amazing campaigner and AOC comes across as a real person, not a politician. She, she comes across as somebody you could actually sit down with and you'd know that she was speaking the, tr the truth to you. Unfortunately, I think many politicians are too prepared, even Boris Johnson, of course, but they're, they're not authentic. AOC is amazingly authentic. Anyway, let's uh, let's move on from that. Um, we're, uh, we were loving watching you suffer here in Ireland. Your day has come. Uh, we have to understand, how did Boris fool a nation? How did he fool a nation? He, he sold the nation. So I think it's a very interesting concept. And I regard it as the Brexit mentality. The idea that you can convince people uh, to vote against their own interests, but you have to do it in a way that that is easy for them to vote away their interests. So they, they, they vote for something thinking that it's going to make life better. In reality, it makes their life worse. Um, it's simple. And you have to almost admire, you don't have to admire him, but you have to almost admire Dominic Cummins when it comes to this. Dominic Cummins met with these focus groups and they would run slogans past them. Get Brexit done. What do you think about that? Get Brexit done. And that was quite popular. So they ran with that and they used it as a slogan and they convinced the people to give Boris Johnson an 80 seat majority. They voted, they focused their campaign really well in marginals um not mastermind stuff but they knew what they were doing and 2019 delivered a massive majority for boris johnson um he, he was not a popular politician but the slogan was popular people were happy with the slogan get brexit done people were tired of, t of hearing about brexit um get you know some people have said if if uh, Jeremy Corbyn had used the same slogan, it would have worked. Yes and no. I think if Jeremy, Slo Jeremy, Jeremy Corbyn had invented the slogan, perhaps it could have worked. But the problem also was Jeremy Corbyn was not a good campaigner. Um, Johnson is a good campaigner. Johnson likes to appear, you know, in cosplay, <laughs> you know, dressed up as a scientist, dressed up as an engineer, dressed up as a as a worker. 
And unfortunately, the public buy into that. The public are convinced by it. I'm not convinced by it. I, I'm pretty sure none of you on the stream are convinced by it. But it convinces the public. They see Boris Johnson dressed as a scientist and they say, oh, he, I don't know what's going through their minds, but they probably think he's doing a good job. Or he's, look, he's down at our level. If Boris, it's a bit like in the United States where back in the 90s and the early 2000s, one of the criteria for voting for president, this is true, was could you have a beer with this person? I care more about policy. I don't care if the person is a robot. <laughs> I don't care if it's a robot running the country, if it's the policies are good and the policies are helping me and the public and dealing with real issues. Maybe a, a robot would be better. <laughs> um, but instead, the public prefers someone they can have a beer with, somebody they could have a burger with, somebody um, that's a bit rough around the edges. They're not interested in policy, unfortunately. I drown him in beer. <laughs> Waste of beer, but worth it. <laughs> um, too much polarization going on. I, I don't want to see the country fail. I want, to, uh, I want the country to be well. I want the suffering to end, yes. Just look right now. Boris pretends to uh, ensure people holidays in exchange. Uh, everyone getting Delta. Don't forget the power influence of the papers in the field. Uh, it's really important. Yes. And of course, yeah, you, you look at the influence of the likes of Murdoch. It's Murdoch is kingmaker, really. And, and it's horrible. But we have to say that it's true. Murdoch is kingmaker. You can't seem to become, it's almost impossible to become prime minister without the backing of the Murdoch empire. They, they still have so much influence. Even in the, in the era of social media, Murdoch still has a huge amount of influence. Murdoch backed Tony Blair, Tony Blair won. Murdoch backed Boris Johnson, Boris Johnson won. It seems to be Keir Starmer needs to get Bar uh, the the Murdoch Empire on board. Maybe if he can convince the Murdochs, yeah, I'll I'll throw you a few bones. I'll lower taxes for billionaires or something like that. Uh, then they'll then they'll support him. But they'll only support him if they think that the Tories aren't going to do as good for him. Murdoch isn't about um, ideology. He's about maintaining his own position he doesn't want to pay any taxes for for billionaires like that they see taxes as a waste they would prefer to spend millions almost out of out of um principle because they hate the idea of paying tax they see it as a waste they hate the idea of poor people getting some sort of welfare getting some sort of benefit getting having a social safety net because they consider poor people as inferior. And if you're poor, well, it's you're, you're a bad person. You haven't uh, achieved anything in your life. So why should my taxes go to support you? So I'm going to pay. I'm going to fund political parties. I don't care the cost. I'm going to do this in sh to make sure that you don't get anything. And I'm going to have a media empire convincing the public that you are the enemy. Think about it for a moment. How a newspaper like the Sun or the Daily Mail or the Express, which is focused, is its its readership, the target readership of the the Express or the Daily Mail or the Sun is the working class, and they have convinced the working class that their greatest enemy is not the billionaires, is not um, businesses, their greatest enemy is their own people our fellow working class people you have to you have to stand back in awe to that it's like if i try to convince remainers the greatest enemy of remainers is other remainers and it worked <laughs> that's the biggest that's the amazing thing about it let's be honest tax taxes theft from birth 
well, the, that's that's how, tax is about redistrib redistributing wealth. Um, I don't have a problem with taxes as long as they go in the right place uh, to making the country well. Uh, but a, a sick economy is one where some people at the top earn all the money, and the people at the bottom uh, are basically slaves. Like in the United States, for example, how how is it possible that one individual has more wealth than I think it's ninety percent of the the population? Jeff Bezos has more money than he could ever spend. He could use some of that money could be used if we taxed him. If we taxed him at ninety percent, he would still be the richest person in the world. But he, instead of ending uh, poverty, homelessness, he he spends that money on uh, trips to the, trips to space for a few minutes. Now he'll say he's doing it for the greater good. No, he's not doing it for the greater good because if he wanted to do something for the greater good, he would end poverty tomorrow. If he wanted, he could end poverty tomorrow. He could sell a few shares <clears throat> and end poverty tomorrow. But he doesn't do that. Why? Because it doesn't have the same prestige. It's about prestige. That's why the the millionaires and billionaires of the past <clears throat> used to put their names on the side of buildings. You know, open a, a museum. Uh, put my name on the side of the museum. It's not because they cared about what the museum represented. It's what they cared about their legacy. They cared about the prestige of it. Look at my name is up there. I'm important. Every time somebody walks past, they will see my name. It's at least, you know, in the past, you get something from it. Now you see just an image uh, on a screen of a guy going into space that's costing millions and billions. Anyway, let's move on. Unfortunately, I have my neighbor is making a lot of noise upstairs. I don't know what they're doing. Moving furniture at this time. So what can the Labour Party do? What can the Labour Party do about all of this? <clears throat> it says here, this is from The Guardian. This is just an opinion piece, but it says, um, can anyone really end poverty, says Kendra? I think so, because poverty is related to money. So if money is the is the issue then we can redirect the money to end poverty <clears throat> a ubi for example would end poverty a ubi costs money i see it as an investment but it, of course it costs money we could we could end poverty with a ubi a ubi definitely would end poverty because people would would have the money to pay for things people would be able to take time off work people wouldn't have to work four or five jobs in order to make ends meet. They would no longer be poverty. I know I said UBI and it triggers a lot of people <laughs> in a positive way. So it says here, Labour shouldn't lurch to the right. It must get out the vote. Um, so Labour has lost the last four general elections from the death throes of, the, of New Labour in 2010 to the implosion of Corbynism in 2019 and end minimum and in between. The party has been out of power for 11 years now, and it falls to Keir Starmer to try and re reverse that trend. The party has um, has an identity crisis that reflects the changing class composition across demographic and geographical divides. In Scotland, the rise of Scottish nationalism and uh, conservative unionism counterweight appears to have closed the door on Labour winning. Um, and short of a landslide, the party used to take for granted it is in dismay defeat it is sorry even in dismay defeat in 2010 no wing of the party in westminster or hollywood hollywood uh, has yet found an answer to that conundrum these challenges are significant but they're not unsurmountable if labor is to win again it has to be crystal clear about its potential voters and the electoral coalition it needs to win yes so there are a number of things i want to say about this the labor party don't have a vision at the moment they need to have a vision. And I've said this before. You need to have something that people associate with you. The SNP, it's independence. The Liberal Democrats, we could say, uh, rejoining the European Union or pro-European pro unionism. Pro-Europeanism. <laughs> Is that European unionism? No, pro-Europeanism. 
um, the Green Party is the environment. The Socialist Party, socialist issues. Workers. But these are smaller parties. But I'm talking about the Labour... What is the Labour Party vision? I don't know what it is. UB40 a day. <laughs> um, UBI40. The what is the Labour Party's goal? What is its vision? It doesn't. I don't think it has a vision at the moment. I think the vision should be workers, and this would include people who are in trade unions and also people who are outside trade unions, people in the gig economy, uh, people who are working three or four jobs to make ends meet, people who are earning a reasonable income, but they're afraid that you know with since Brexit, with uh, changes that are taking place, how workers' protections are disappearing, that they are at risk. There's a huge... The vast majority of people work. And the vast majority of people, I think, are concerned about their future. Some people are in secure jobs. Most people are not. Job security is a huge issue, I think, for most people. If you're working in the gig economy, it doesn't exist. Can you imagine if you're working in the gig economy or something like that, and a party comes forward and says, we're going to protect you. We're going to put in place measures that will make sure that your boss can't call you five minutes before your shift starts and say, we don't need you today. We're going to protect you from that. We're not going to have people working in warehouses like Amazon where they have to pee inside bottles because they don't have time to go to take a break. Or if they take a break, they get punished because they don't turn return in time. We're going to protect people from that. There are huge numbers of people who are not being protected. And I think the Labour Party could reach out to those and say, we're going to be the party for you. Copy something of maybe... Um, I don't like the idea of copying things because when you copy it, it is never the, it's never the same as the original. But something like Bernie Sanders in the United States... Bernie Sanders managed to convince Amazon to give workers a $15 minimum wage. Um, something like that. You need to say, and but it, it takes time and it takes a lot of effort. It requires protests. It requires movements. Um, it's not something you can do overnight, but you have to build on something. And there's a huge voter block out there that includes people who are working class, people who are middle class, those who are on gig, the, in the gig economy, people who have maybe semi, uh, semi-secure jobs. Those are the people you need to target. Say, so we're going to work for you. Because I think everyone um, is concerned about their future. I'd love to know your, your comments, guys, because uh, I don't know if I, maybe I'm barking up the wrong tree here. But I don't think it's so much a left-wing idea or a right-wing idea. I think it's about saying, we're going to fight for you. And I think the conservatives like to paint the Labour Party as, oh, they're more concerned with wokeness or than they are with workers. And I don't think that's true. I think it's just an attempt to, um, to tarnish the Labour Party in a sense, to say that they're focused on fringe issues and they're not, they're not interested in bread and butter issues. Um, education stands for wealth um, even if it isn't money would the EU accept uh, communist UK I, I think you have to defend in a sense they they have accepted a fascist Hungary so <laughs> they, at the moment anyway so I think they would accept a communist UK it, it depends on with, see, the European Union will accept anyone, any country, as long as they align with European ideals. So if a communist UK was against freedom of uh, expression, the EU would have a problem with that. Or um, the right to a free trial. Certain you know, core beliefs of the European Union, if you're not willing to align with that, then it would not accept you. It doesn't matter if you're on the right or on the left. Um, I would like to clone B uh, Bernie Sanders for the German government. <laughs> I, 
I, I love Bernie Sanders. Uh, I had some criticisms of his. Uh, I don't know what he's doing at the moment because I'm not following American politics very closely at all. But the Labour Party need to find a vision. Um, and it needs to, so it says here, it needs to be clear about the potential voters and the coalition. And of course, yes, a coalition. You, The Labour Party are not going to win a majority on their own. It's almost impossible for them because of first past the post. So until first past the post is replaced, the Labour Party are going to probably sit in opposition. I hope I'm wrong, but it's like it's more likely than not that the Labour Party are going to sit in opposition. If they form a coalition, a progressive alliance with the SNP, the, uh, the Greens, the Liberal Democrats, and focus the campaigning to take out Tories, to take out Tory seats, then they could form a government with, you know, with the Liberal Democrats, the Greens, and that's just to form a government. Then introduce proportional representation and then immediately call an election, an election based on proportional representation. And then you would have a completely different uh, political makeup then. But at the moment, I don't see any real call for that. Unfortunately, and I think Labour Party are not going to get anywhere unless they form a progressive alliance. So it says here, electoral strategy is not just a value um, is not a value free science. The political leanings of strategists inevitably influence the kind of voters they wish to attract. Those who advocate targeting conservative voters want Labour to be tougher on um, migration, security, social security, and law and order. I don't think that's necessary because what are people's real fears for the future about jobs, about jobs for their children, about jobs for their grandchildren? What sort of future is available for them? Are they going to be able to get a job? Are they going to be able to get a job that allows them to perhaps buy a house? Um, are they going to be stuck in, you know, in rented accommodation for the rest of their life? You have. I, I think this is something that the Labour Party could latch on to. Say, what are your concerns? I'm concerned about migrants. Okay, but you know, when people say some of these voters you can't reach, but in reality, okay, are you concerned about your job? Are you happy with your job? Would you like to change your job? Why would you like to change your job? Um, uh, because I don't like my boss, or I have to do this job because uh, I have not. There's nothing else available. Uh, would you like if there was something else available? Would you like if you had better protections at work where um, your boss just couldn't f fire you at any moment or force you to do extra work, extra overtime that's unpaid? Yes, I'd like somebody to protect me from that. Then you need to vote for us in a short sense. Those um, tougher on migration, social security and law and order being... Le um, while being less bold in spending commitments. We can disagree on the approach to rebuilding the party, but we should. Um, but what should be beyond the argument is the data. That's why present presentation briefing, that's why a presentation briefing uh, to last weekend's Observer by Labour's new strategy director, Deborah Matteson, is concerning. It's uh, allegedly stated that Labour must lure millions of dis disaffected uh, millions who dis defected to the Labour uh, to the cons sorry to the Tories in 2019. The data uh, must be numbers involving uh, suggest sorry. The data about the numbers involves suggesting otherwise. Winning back voters who defected to the Conservatives is nearly, but not sufficient. Necessary but not sufficient, uh, because there simply aren't millions of them. Labour's internal analysis, based on the British Electoral st Study in the aftermath of the 2019 defeat showed that the Labour, uh, showed that Labour lost only 300,000 votes to the Tories, a similar number defected to the Brexit party. Yes, uh, there is, there was, it wasn't that there was a huge shift to um, the Tories. What happened was many voters didn't turn out. A, a significant number went to the Tories, but that was because of Brexit. You can see here a similar number defected the Brexit party. So people voted for Brexit. It wasn't so much voting for the Tories, 
they were told by the Tories that we'll get Brexit done. So they voted for for the Brexit party. The Brexit party in name and the Tories under the guise of the Brexit party. These people are either not going to vote next time or they're, they would be willing to vote for the Labour Party. But you need to offer them something. But I think a big problem also back in 2019 is many people did not turn out to vote. They were not convinced by the leadership. In the same election, Labour lost almost uh, lost about 600,000 votes to the Liberal Democrats and Greens. If Labour triangles too far to conservative positions, the party's younger voters are like will could likely fracture to the minor parties, as the May 2021 ge- uh, council election, Bristol, and the May- London mayoral election showed. Some have also uh, some have used Labour's crushing defeat in Hartlepool in May as a vindication of the calls uh, to move to the right. To win back the red wall, Labour must appeal to conservative voters. No, look, if somebody's Tory light, look, if you have a, a if you have two parties, one is Tory and the other is Tory light, the voter will always, if they're going to vote for the right, they're going to vote for the Tories. They're not going to vote for Tory light. Because if, if your issue is immigration, and you want a party that's tough on immigration, then you're going, to, you're going to vote for the Conservative Party. You're not going to vote for the Labour Party. There aren't people who are on on the fence when it comes to immigration. So I wouldn't touch the, the issue of immigration. The Conservative, the, the Labour Party seem to think, OK, people want to vote for... The, Racists will vote for the Conservative Party. Now, in the past, some racists, of course, did vote for the Labour Party, but that was more out of tradition. I don't think they voted because they cared about the Labour Party. People don't vote on policy. People vote according to their feelings. Um, But when it comes to issues like immigration or whatever, if people are racist, people will vote for the most racist party. That's it. Um... But I, I think the Labour Party are really barking up the wrong tree here if they think we can win over Conservatives. So we need to shift to the right in order to win over Conservatives. It's not going to work because right-wing voters will not vote for the Labour Party. They'll vote for the Conservatives. Um, you need to provide something else. You need to provide something that's more, more tangible. And I think it would be the idea of supporting Labour, so Labour workers, supporting workers. Get back to what you used to represent. Uh, Let me read some of your comments because I've been ranting a lot. You seem to care about us, the UK citizens. Uh, Why do you care about us? Uh, We did this to ourselves and we deserve no care. Only the the bed we made for ourselves. I'm glad you care about, uh, but we don't deserve it. Uh, Mickey G. I I care about, the people have asked me this before. Why do I care about what's happening in Britain? I care about what's happening in Britain because I have friends and family there. And since I started this channel, the number of friends and fam- well, family, no, but the number of friends I've created um, through this channel has exploded. And I feel a personal connection with a lot of people uh, who interact with me on a daily basis on the channel or on Discord. And I care about them and I care about what's happening to them. And I, it frustrates me that People will vote for the Conservative Party even though Boris Johnson lies through his nose every day. Boris Johnson is almost... Imp- it's, it's almost impossible for him to tell the truth. If Boris Johnson says, today is... You know, we're in the month of August, I'd have to check the calendar. Because I couldn't believe him. Because it's it's impossible to believe Boris Johnson. But lies have a consequence. When Boris Johnson lies to the public, they many people believe it and they vote against their own interests. And they don't just vote against their own interests, they vote against the interests of others. And I think freedom of movement is a perfect example of that. How racist, generally racist, I'm not going to say everyone, but generally racist voted for Brexit to end freedom of movement. Or, Of course, they didn't believe in freedom of movement, they just wanted to keep foreigners out. But a, a consequence was the ending of freedom of movement. They don't care that it impacts people who voted to remain. 
you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if they said, okay, freedom of movement ends for Brexiteers, because that's what they wanted. But freedom of movement doesn't end for people who voted Remain. Of course, you know, you couldn't have a system like that. But I find that extremely frustrating and it's not affecting me but it's frustrating for for my british friends and family they're suffering the consequences of somebody who voted either based on ignorance or based on hate they're suffering so the brexiteers i don't give a crap if they suffer because that's what they voted for and they're and they're still many of them are still happy with that they're still banging on about how brexit is a success even though something like freedom of movement has been taken away so there are people today whose children or grandchildren will not be able to experience the same uh, joy of being able to travel and stay in Europe as their parents did or their grandparents did before freedom of movement ended. Yes, they can still do it, but it's much more difficult now. It's much more expensive as well. It's no longer uh, accessible to to people the way it was before because somebody wanted it ended. Somebody who decided out of ignorance or out of hate. And I can't support that. I can't. And I'll, and I'll continue to speak out against it. And I'm also concerned about how lies, the lies of Boris Johnson, the lies of Nigel Farage, are so easily spread that they can be picked up anywhere. And I'm concerned if there are fascist movements here in Italy or fascist movements around Europe um, anti-European movements which have looked have viewed Nigel Farage and understood how successful he has been I want to emulate that want to copy it want to use the tools that he he used to to borrow some of his snake oil in order to convince the public around Europe and you know Britain is not a special case Brexit could have happened anywhere and in a sense, the people of, of Britain were primed due to the corrupt media, the likes of The Sun, the Daily Mail, billionaires convincing poor people to vote against their own interests. Not because, just because of Brexit, but for decades, telling poor people, your greatest enemy is the single mother who's on welfare. Your greatest enemy is the, uh, the, the nurses who are asking a, a pay rise or teachers who are, who are teaching your children. These people are the enemies, are your enemies. Firefighters even. When firefighters decided we're, we want to go on strike, what happened? The right-wing media and their friends in the government attacked them. So I, I stand up against that. I stand up to that. And I'll continue to do it. Uh, Tom Nelson, thank you so much for that super chat. Um, every lie we tell incurs a debt to the truth. Sooner or later, that debt is paid. Yes. Um, some people lie and they pay the consequences. Some people lie and somebody else pays the consequences. And I think Brexit is a perfect example of the latter. Boris Johnson, Jacob Rees-Mogg, Nigel Farage and others lied and the British people paid the consequence. And I'm pissed off about that. Because they should be suffering the consequences. The liar should suffer the consequence of the lie. Anyway, let's uh, let's move. Oh, we're almost at the end of the stream for tonight. And I got a bit of a rant going there. Um, I, I want to sh just... I, I don't want to finish on this, but it, well, I have to show it because I think it's important. Pandemic, furlough, recession and redundancies. For many, the last 18 months has been an uphill struggle. But for some, just keeping the power on has been a fight. There has been times where I've had two or three duvets on the, um, on the sofa, you know, just to ensure that I'm warm. For Anthony, his two small children and many more, it's about to get worse, as the energy regulator is allowing energy firms to increase prices by at least £139 a year. My family will be questioning food versus fuel um, in, in the real terms. It's really that stark? Yeah. 
Um, we, we already are on a knife edge anyway with our finances. Um, we rely on the local church who have been fantastic to give us that little bit of food top up when we need it. This man has to rely on a, on a charity, a church charity, to, to have access to food. What is the point of universal credit? What is the point of a social safety net if it, if it doesn't exist? It doesn't save people. What is the point of that? I've said before, we need to move to a UBI. A UBI would resolve this problem. This man doesn't have enough money to pay his bills. He doesn't have enough money. He has to decide, do I pay the bills or do I put food on the table? A UBI, of course, would, illumin would eliminate that problem. But the response from the government is, we, can't, we don't want to go down the road of a UBI because it's too expensive. Let's just stick with what we know. A universal cre universal credit but universal credit obviously is not working if somebody has to rely on a food bank then universal credit has failed even if it's one person it has failed because that's not what it's supposed to do like if you bought a car and the car didn't go would you say the car was a success no you would say the car is a failure i need to change the car you wouldn't stick with the car. You wouldn't push it around. You wouldn't ask people to push you around in it. Well, maybe unless you're Jacob Rees-Mogg. But you would replace it. You would say it's not working. Change it. Um, and uh, those facilities only have so much available. That will probably result in me having nights where I don't have dinner so the kids can have dinner. From October 1st, customers on default tariffs will see their price increase capped at £139, a 12% price hike on the average bill. Prepayment customers will see their bill increase by £153, up 13%. And this comes on top of a previous lift in April, meaning that prices since last autumn have gone up by more than a fifth. This is a twice yearly review by Ofgem, the energy regulator, who reason a rise is needed because the market price of gas and electricity has almost doubled since the last time the price cap was raised. Last year, Centrica, what everyone knows as British Gas, made almost half a billion pounds. Scottish Power, nearly a billion. SSC, 1.5 billion. Why aren't they picking up the tab here as opposed to hard up families? Well, profits in the market as a whole, in the retail market as a whole, are around zero. They're slightly less than zero. So this is making sure that customers only pay a fair price for their... <laughs> but what do businesses do? They declare that we've made no profit because they, they hand over the money to their shareholders. The shareholders make the money and then what's left to reinvest in the company is zero. So the company declare we've made no profit because they take off the dividend before they declare the profit. They don't say, we've made this amount of profit, now we're going to give it to the, uh, we're going to reinvest it or we're going to use it to cut costs. No, Divid the, the shareholders are profiting from this and the, the consumer is paying the difference. Of energy. Are you really expecting us to believe that energy firms are less able to foot the bill here than hard up families? So what we are saying is that families should pay only a fair price for their energy. We don't want to go back to the bad old days where companies charged unfair profits. And we take a billion pounds out of this market every year in supplier profit and put it back into the pockets of customers. These hikes, the highest for nearly a decade, will hit 15 million households. Two million of them already behind on energy bills, according to citizens' advice. The energy industry insists they're not putting profits before people. It's clearly been and going to be a really difficult period for many people. We've paid out millions of pounds through the pandemic to support customers and the industry has got measures in place to support the most vulnerable or anyone worried about paying their bill this winter. So our message is if you are worried, phone your supplier. Both. And the supplier will say, what? <laughs> the supplier will say, uh, you need to pay your bills, otherwise we'll cut you off. The regulator and the energy companies are at pains to point out that there are subsidies and payment plans for customers struggling financially. But just yesterday, the Bank of England warned that by the end of the year, inflation could hit 4%. So the cost of living is on the rise. And the government is still planning to cut the temporary uplift to universal credit, in some cases worth £20 a week. So furlough is finishing. The universal credit uplift is going to be cut. 
inflation is going to reach 4% and the energy companies are going to raise prices. And the response from the government is nothing. So for some families already struggling to make ends meet, the autumn is looking bleak. Yes, fact not fiction. Um, sorry, no, as, um, Colin says, I thought the utilities were privatized because they made no profit. But if it was fine, if but it's fine if private ownership does the same. They're not making no profit. <laughs> well, in some cases, they're subsidized. If they are making no profit, they're subsidized by the state. Um, these are not. Re this is not real capitalism, where the businesses operate on the on the idea of making a profit. Um, they get huge subsidies from the state. They they're able to shaft people, and they get away with it. Maybe some of these industries should be nationalized if. Uh, if they're costing too much money. The charity that has been helping to feed Anthony over the last year says they're preparing for many more through the door. We understand and are preparing for a real pent up demand for services for Christian Against Poverty and further debt advice organisations, uh, which is only going to be exacerbated with the timing of these cost increases in energy, these reductions in income through universal credit and potentially the unemployment cost through the end of the furlough scheme. Energy firms and the regulator insist better deals are still to be had by switching suppliers. But for many already in debt, that isn't an option. And whichever way they look at it, the prospect of this coming winter is a cold one. As I said before, a universal basic income would fix this. And the response from government is, no, we're going to stick with universal credit. Universal credit is not working, but we're not going to go down the road of a universal basic income. Now, it seems Wales um, is introducing a pilot scheme at the moment, so let's keep an eye on that. The Scottish, the Scottish National Party have in their manifesto to uh, introduce a UBI. I'm looking forward to seeing some information from that as well. Because if these trials work... If they're a success, which is difficult because they're not true UBIs, they're not perfect examples of, of a UBI. But if we can see them rolled out and in a positive way, there's a positive feedback from uh, the public and from the entities who are responsible for them, for the, for example, local government or uh, regional governments, then uh, our governments like Wales and Scotland, then we're going to... Um, perhaps see a move towards the UBI and then we're not going to see stories like this anymore. Um, just get to your feet on those streets because of the way things are going. Uh, you're after only six months into Brexit, eight months into Brexit. Do you even want to imagine what's going to be like after 12, in 12 months time? The problem is that people don't protest. I had said, I think it was on the on the live stream last week, uh, last Tuesday with um, with Rob, the British people, w when the, in the, what was it, the beginning of the year, I think it was in January, when the fishing industry was suffering, they sent a few lorries down from Scotland to Westminster. They drove around Westminster and then they left. They were there for a day and then they left. That is not a protest. That's not sending a message to the Prime Minister. Sending a message to the Prime Minister would be blockading the roads for a week. Blockading Westminster. Putting the, putting the politicians under pressure. Blockading their, um, their constituency offices. Making a lot of noise. That's how you protest. But instead... The, the, the Scottish fishermen drove down with a few slogans on their lorries, drove around for, for an hour or two, and then left. And that was it. They were interviewed, they complained, and then that was it. And did Boris Johnson do anything? Boris Johnson wasn't even there. I think he was at Chequers at the time. So the protest was useless. And I think maybe because some of them felt guilty... They felt embarrassed. I actually voted for this and now I'm protesting against it or uh, protesting against the consequences. 
uh, I think Phil from a different bias some a long time ago he said the British don't protest they grumble and maybe that's true and the politicians know this and they know that they can push the public as far as they want you can't make a noise anymore yes protests have been made have been rendered illegal uh, you'd be arrested if you make too much noise If people want things to change and the government don't want thing to cha- things to change, then um, they have to protest. And if you can't protest around Ma- Westminster, protest at constituency offices. Get, get your voice out there. Always peaceful. Always peaceful. But blockade. When the, pro- when the minister is trying to go to work, when the minister is leaving their home... Um, no no violence of course but make them feel uncomfortable say you voted for this why aren't you doing something to help us we're going to remain here until something is done and you know you have to do you have to have a long term thinking here you can't just do it for a day or a couple of hours and then leave because the politicians will forget about you i remember the poll tax riots uh did the law already pass then i think so i think they've it was the security bill. Anyway, guys, we're over the end of the stream for tonight. Um, before we finish, of course, we'll have our one for the road. Um, I want to say a massive thank you to everyone who came on tonight. I hope it wasn't too depressing, but I think these these issues have to be talked about. I, I really hope that the Labour Party are going to take their finger out, find a vision and work with it. And I do hope stories like this will wake people up to the benefits of a UBI. Did I hear violence? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, it slipped out and then I was like, oh crap, hopefully nobody will notice. But Conservator notice it. Uh, but I, I don't want to be depressing, but I think we have to take take stock of what's negative and try and find something positive. Use this as a means to make the world a better place. Um, for especially those at the bottom. Those who are ignored, the poor and the working class. <laughs> Violence gets attention. It does, but uh, I can't advocate for that. So guys, once again, thanks for every- thanks to everyone for coming on tonight. Thanks for all of your super chats. Greatly appreciated as always. And thanks to the moderators for doing a wonderful job keeping the stream on the straight and narrow. But don't go yet because we have our one for the road. I hope you enjoy this. Uh, Lord Digby Jones here, uh, degree, degree. Um, I just don't like women speaking in working class accents. I mean, working class people should know their place. They shouldn't be on television. They shouldn't be in the National Theatre. They shouldn't be in sport and they shouldn't be commentating. If you speak like Eliza Doolittle in My Fair Lady and I can't teach you proper English, then you're going to have to stay in the house until I come run and teach you Professor Higgins like. It's that simple. Don't want to hear working class voices, but it's just it's too hard on my wee gentle ears. Diggity, diggity. <laughs> diggity, diggity. Digby Jones. <laughs> so Digby Jones, of course, was complaining about uh, BBC uh, commentator, I think it was, who spoken or nat- natural language <laughs> um, but I think Digby Jones should probably go away and be very quiet for a long time because Digby Jones said back uh, I think in 2016 or 2015 that the German car industry would come running to Britain's rescue because they would put pressure on Angela Merkel to put pressure on the European Union to give Britain a good deal uh, that would be on the day after the referendum vote and it hasn't happened, but Digby Jones is still shouting his uh, shouting his mouth off, and invited on TV to talk about things. I really don't understand why. You know, how can you be so wrong about something and still be invited on TV? But then it's a common problem. So, guys, thanks so much for coming on tonight. Thanks for all of your super chats. Thanks to all the uh, thanks for sharing the videos around the internet as well. It's a great way to support the channel. You can also become a Patreon and you have access to Discord. And after the stream, we have a post-stream chat. So I hope to see some Discord people there, some Patreons there. 
Um, have a great weekend. Thanks also to the moderators, I, I have to say again. Thanks to everyone. So have a great weekend. Um, remember to stay safe. And as Boris Johnson says, stay alert. I'll have um, I'll see you all next Tuesday. Same bat time, same bat channel. Um, 9.30 British summertime. Uh, so have a great weekend and stay safe and have a good one. Uh, and I'll see you soon. Take care. Good night.